Uranium is born of organized chaos. Deep in the heart of massive stars, several times larger than our sun, elements heavier than about xenon are created during supernova events. Under heat and pressure conditions unfathomable to humans, huge fluxes of neutrons interact with atoms in a process called rapid neutron capture, or R process nucleosynthesis. Atoms gain neutrons, which then undergo beta minus decay, converting the neutron to a proton and emitting an electron and a neutrino. At the lowermost layer of these huge exploding stars, neutron capture happens hundreds of times per second to build heavier and heavier unstable elements before they can decay away. At the end of this process is the heaviest primordial element, uranium. It's as if all the energy of an exploding sun was directed into creating this extreme element. And, because the universe has a wry sense of humor, we found a way to release the power of that sun on our own world. But that's a different story. This story is about uranium in Washington. And to tell that story, we need the Earth, and a few billion years. Most of the uranium on Earth is primordial, meaning it was here and incorporated into the Earth's elemental makeup during its initial formation. There are some arguments that distant supernova have added to Earth's uranium content as recently as a couple hundred million years ago, but depending on which cosmochemists you talk to, most of Earth's uranium was formed between 6 and 10 billion years ago, either way long before our solar system coalesced. Once the uranium is in the Earth system, geochemistry dictates where it winds up. Uranium isn't predisposed to forming complexes with metals, and instead loves oxygen. As a result, it tends to sequester itself in rock, or a crust, and is what's known as a lithophile element. Earth has a tendency to recycle crust thanks to plate tectonics. Each time material is subducted or melted, there's a tiny bit of uranium that tries its hardest to go back into the crust. Over the course of the last few billion years, repeated melting and erosion and subduction and remelting has sequestered more and more uranium in the continental crust. As a result, the mantle today is uranium depleted, somewhere in the 0.004 parts per million range. Continental crust, on the other hand, has 1.4 ppm uranium on average. As a result, uranium is actually fairly common in all kinds of rocks. That sets the stage for Washington State. The geology of Northeast Washington is, to coin a phrase, libsumnub. To use real words, it's complex. Home to some of the oldest rocks in the state, there's a lot of variety in the rock types and geologic processes that have affected them. For the discerning rock hound, everything from gold to fossils can be found in the region known as the Okanagan Highlands, bound by Canada and Idaho to the north and east, the Columbia River flood basalts to the south, and the Cascades to the west. The interestingness of the highlands is a result of several hundred million years of the crust being stretched and smeared and smooshed during the building of Washington. Five metamorphic core complexes are found here, products of continental rifting that weakened crust and allowed uplift of basement rocks. The weakened crust was also intruded by several pulses of magmatism, some of which erupted, but not all. Northeast of Spokane, at 100 million and 50 million years ago, two pulses of magma cooled deep underground to form a granite and a quartz monzonite. Monzonite is basically granite with less quartz. These granites were uplifted during the core complex evolution and would later erode to form Mount Spokane. A very similar quartz monzonite that's about 75 million years old, coincidentally the age of peak metamorphism in the core complex, is found 45 miles west on the Spokane Indian Reservation. Both of these regions have been deformed and faulted, allowing for hydrothermal alteration. It's this hydrothermal alteration that likely enriched uranium via upwelling groundwater. Where or what the subterranean uranium source is has not been identified. Secondary uranium mineral occurrences include low-grade disseminations in sandstone, shale, and limestone. This is the host rock of the massive uranium operations in the southwest. In Washington state, it's a different story. Here, commercial uranium has only been found in and near the contact of granite and the rock granite intrudes, in shear zones cutting these rock types, and or as secondary minerals impregnating the fractured, decomposed, and disintegrated granitic and metamorphic rocks adjacent to contacts and shear zones. These geologic conditions are the same for concentrating copper, gold, silver, and some other heavy metals. In Washington, looking for those associated minerals is actually a decent way to start prospecting for uranium. 
These days, we can use other tools as well, like radon hazard maps from the Washington Department of Natural Resources. Radon is a natural byproduct of the decay of uranium, thorium, and or radium in the soil and bedrock. The radon hazards almost mirror the geologic map of the state, with the highest risk, generally speaking, in Mesozoic intrusive rocks. But this radon map wasn't produced until 1993, long after uranium mining in Washington state ended. Oddly enough, uranium was important to Washington long before any was ever mined here. Everyone knows about the Manhattan Project and the race against the Nazis to create the first atomic bomb. And most everyone, and certainly Washingtonians, know about Hanford, the now decommissioned nuclear production complex that was home to the first full-scale plutonium production reactor and also refined plutonium that was in the Trinity nuclear test on July 16, 1945, and the Fat Man device that bombed Nagasaki on August 9th that same year. The uranium resources of Washington went untapped and mostly undiscovered during this frenzied period, with the sources instead being some of the Navajo lands in the southwest but primarily the high-grade ore from the Congo. The nascent technology of refining uranium was much easier with a purer starting point, and the Congo had the dubious honor of hosting some of the richest uranium deposits in the world. But of course, the end of World War II was just the beginning of the need for uranium. And it was in the spring of 1954 that winds of change swept through northeast Washington. In the middle of the night of April 4th, 1954, John and James Jim Lebret of the Spokane tribe were prospecting on the Spokane reservation for Shelight using an ultraviolet light and Geiger counter. During their trek on the southern slopes of Spokane Mountain, their Geiger counter screamed to life when they encountered fluorescent uranium minerals. Jim and John were experienced enough to recognize the importance of their finds. The deposit was named the Midnight Mine, a portmanteau of the late hour of their discovery, and the spelling of Autonite, that glowing mineral that they encountered. They quickly formed a partnership with other members of the Spokane tribe to explore the property and developed it as kind of a mom and pop operation during that summer. They delivered their first shipment of uranium ore by winter, and by that time several big mining companies were making serious inquiries about acquiring the mine. The partnership allowed the Dawn Mining Company to take over in 1955. Dawn Mining formed as the partnership between the original members as Midnight Mines, Inc., and the Newmont Mining Company of New York. I should note here that uranium minerals were documented in Washington earlier, for example by 1950 at the Spokane Molybdenum Mine, six miles southwest of Midnight. But the development of the Midnight Mine was what sparked uranium fever across the state. Despite over 100 prospects that cropped up around the Midnight area and Spokane Mountain, it would only be here and at a few other locations, mostly in Stevens and Spokane counties, that uranium was found in commercially viable quantities. One of those locations was Mount Spokane, which is confusingly a different place than Spokane Mountain about 45 miles away. Mount Spokane is one of Washington's tallest non-cascade peaks at 5,883 feet and is made of the same suite of rocks as at midnight. In the early 1940s, a pair of brothers were digging post holes in their father's ranch on the northwest flank of Mount Spokane. Leonard and Alfred Dahl found an unusual greenish-yellow mineral during the dig and thought it interesting, but, you know, the boys had work to do. It wasn't until hearing about the discovery of uranium minerals on the Spokane Indian Reservation that the sharp-minded brothers dug out their greenish flaky mineral and discovered they had autonite on their hands. Sometimes it pays to have a rock collection. In February 1955, they allowed exploratory sampling and six months later delivered the first ore shipment from the ranch. Brief sidebar here. The Daybreak Mine in Spokane is the type locality for a variety of autonite called meta-autonite. The type locality for autonite is, as we all know, Autun, a town in Burgundy, France, where the mineral was described in 1852. Meta-autonite was created experimentally by dehydrating autonite in 1904, but it wasn't until finding it at daybreak that the mine was designated the type locality. Autonite and meta-autonite are often found in close proximity because the only difference is in the hydration state, or the amount of water, in the mineral. Autonite can dehydrate to meta-autonite in a matter of a few hours in dry atmosphere. And as a result, it's likely that many specimens of autonite are actually meta-autonite. And since this distinction is really a case of splitting atoms, I mean hairs, it's less confusing to lump them together and call whatever green flaky uranium mineral you find, autonite. I think we've said autonite enough times that we ought to define it. So, uh, here it is. 
What does that chemical formula mean? Well, it's a hydrous calcium uranyl phosphate. Simple enough. The phosphate, in Washington anyway, originated in apatite crystals in the granitic host rock, which was hydrothermally altered and leached. The uranyl ion, UO2, has a positive 2 plus charge, and since oxygen is almost always in an oxidative state of 2 minus, the uranium is 6 plus, or hexavalent uranium. It's the tabular nature of the crystal cell that causes the characteristic habit of autunite to form in books, with perfect cleavage much like mica. An additional two perpendicular cleavage planes occur in daybreak autunite that results in square or rectangular particles when it's crushed. Rockhounds today mostly find it as small, crumbly flakes in the dirt. When mining was in full swing, the occasional larger piece was found and preserved. These bonanza pieces, as they're called, could be clusters of autunite two feet long. Perfect specimens weren't the main goal of miners like the Labrettes and the Dolls. John and Jim Labret, in particular, were savvy businessmen and took full advantage of their find. They would reach retirement age as millionaires, I'm pretty sure, and for a while the Spokane tribe reaped unexpected rewards from their compulsory relocation. You see, the United States government doesn't have a great track record when it comes to Indian affairs. Back in the day, the Spokane and other Salish-speaking tribes were dispersed across millions of acres in northeast Washington, Idaho, and even Montana. The Spokane were semi-nomadic, traveling the watersheds of the Spokane and Columbia Rivers, with more than half of their diet coming from fish. Unfortunately for them, the U.S. needed that land in the name of progress, and in 1881, President Rutherford B. Hayes established the Spokane Indian Reservation at its current location about 35 miles northwest of Spokane. Like in many other instances, the land set aside special for the Spokane was of little economic value to the U.S. It didn't host any silver or gold, and it wasn't in prime farmland. A few fluorescent minerals changed everything. Suddenly, the government desperately needed land it once deemed worthless. Unemployment was and continues to be an issue on the reservation. One of the few reliable jobs was in timber, but timber prices rise and fall at the whims of industry, and uranium prices, on the other hand, were set by the Atomic Energy Commission and included incentives like a $10,000 bonus for proving up a prospect. The uranium boom provided upwards of 500 jobs to the Spokane, not just at the mine, but at the uranium processing mill financed by Don Mining. The mill was located on the edge of the reservation at Ford, Washington. It's also called a recovery facility, where uranium ore was crushed and leached by sulfuric acid and ionic exchange techniques to recover more pure uranium. It also held tailings from an estimated 3.1 million tons of ore that went through the facility between 1957 and 1981. I'm using the past tense here because the mill itself is gone, but the tailings and uranium waste remain. Rockhounds hoping for an easy uranium mineral score will be sorely disappointed at midnight and the Ford Mill. Like I said, the mill is gone, and most of the tailings are buried as part of the Superfund cleanup project in the area. The tailings scheduled to be covered are just a silty mud as a result of the processing and leaching. The midnight mine sits behind six-foot fences, and there's enough construction and cleanup activity that the public is not allowed in. Apparently, the old fences were easily maneuvered around and trespassing by humans and wildlife was common. Wildlife is still a problem in the area. Environmental hazards have a tendency to migrate, and contamination has spread to the Blue Creek stream downhill from the mine. Residents are discouraged from eating fish or game that lives in or eats plants near the creek. That's a real gut punch for people that historically lived off the land. And it might not just be the water, either. There's likely uranium dust scattered across the reservation, and there's the whole thing where, you know, people worked up close and personal with the stuff in the mines and mill. There's more than one account of people being told the uranium was harmless. I'm also guessing the truck drivers in these photos weren't wearing masks while kicking up ore dust. I haven't yet mentioned the Sherwood mine, even though it had the potential to be Washington's largest uranium producer. Owned by Western Nuclear, the Sherwood Mine and Mill is located southwest of Midnight, still on the Spokane Tribe Reservation, essentially on the bank of the Spokane River. The Midnight Mine produced about 10 million pounds of yellow cake between 1955 and 1979 and had reserves of 2 million plus. The Sherwood Mine, which only started operations in 1978, had reserves of over 14.2 million pounds of U308, with the mill able to produce around a million pounds a year. But the uranium market went bust in the early 1980s. The production was initially heavily subsidized by the government, and those subsidies and incentives lapsed as the U.S. uranium stockpile grew fat. 
the $10,000 incentive went away in the 60s, and uranium imports were allowed starting in the late 1970s. Environmental and other concerns with nuclear power also diminished broad support for more mining, and relatively speaking, the U.S. uranium ground reserves just didn't hold up against the rich ore found abroad. Anyway, back to Washington. The Sherwood Mine and Processing Mill started operations in the waning hours of the uranium boom. The uranium concentration was a product of similar geology as at midnight, and Sherwood operated until 1984 and never even reached the main ore body before shutting down. Yet it produced almost 3 million tons of tailings that were later impounded and covered in a synthetically lined pit that other contaminated soils and debris from the deconstructed mill was also placed in. The Midnight, Sherwood, and Daybreak mines were the only three commercial production uranium mines in Washington. The Daybreak mine uranium deposit was 100 times smaller compared to the other two, and was quickly mined out, but did yield world-class autonite and meta-autonite. If you're exploring Northeast Washington, it's worth your while to carry a UV light and, if you're keen, a Geiger counter. There are scattered uranium deposits and likely some as yet unproven deposits. The likelihood of finding a commercially viable mine is low, but maybe that's for the best. Better to just keep an eye out for unique specimens. I've talked mostly about autonite as the uranium mineral of choice in Washington, but there are other species found in the state. What else has been found? Well, there's uraninite and pitchblende, which are two of the main uranium ores that were found at midnight and elsewhere. Uh, well, there's also torbernite, branerite, uranophane, and uranium-bearing minerals like monazite and alanite. There are also reports of zunorite, fergusonite, samarskite, euxonite, and sertolite. Honestly, there are so many uranium minerals and complexes out there that I wouldn't be surprised if there was a new uranium mineral waiting to be found in Washington state. We just need someone out there poking around and asking questions. 